Evening all. So, tonight, we're continuing our sermon series entitled God and Sexuality. At St Michael's, we're committed to learning and growing together. It's one of the um, statements there on our vision banners. And to do this well, we're looking to strengthen the quality of our thinking on some current topics. God and sexuality, this evening's sermon series, will help us focus on five key areas of human sexuality. And these topics will help us identify key areas of discussion around our common experience of human sexuality. There's a more detailed course called Living in Love and Faith that we're going to be running in March this year. And these topics are part of a broader conversation in the Church of England as we navigate our way through discussions on human sexuality. We hope to raise questions, model generosity and encourage debate in the body of Christ. And even when there are differences of opinion, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So, as James has said, these sermons are best digested alongside our morning sermon series on Living Well Together. So do catch up with those online if you've missed them. So this evening, it's my turn to speak on sex and marriage. Good luck, me. <laughs> I had a pretty chaotic ride through my teenage years. In my first year of university in particular, I lurched from one relationship to another, giving myself away sexually far too readily and in a way that left me feeling cheap and used, not good about myself at all. A bit like the fragmentation that Sai spoke about a few weeks ago. Looking back, I can see that I was searching for something. I really was very lost. I hit a crunch point at the start of my second year when, emerging from a complicated set of relationships with three men, I had this sudden realization when I was painting the ceiling of the kitchen one day. There must be more to life than men. And this revelation set me off on a different search, a spiritual search, a search that led me to Jesus and to a relationship of love and trust that has transformed my life. It made everything I'd ever experienced before with men pale into insignificance. I'd found in Jesus what I was looking for, the knowledge that I was loved, precious in his sight, honored, and that he had plans and purposes for my life. I moved to Bristol after uni and met Chris soon after, and we were married at Christchurch Clifton on the 10th of September, 1983. Wholehearted for God and wanting to honor him in every way we could, we chose to keep sex for marriage. I love the bit of the, in the preface of the marriage service that says this, the gift of marriage brings husband and wife together in the delight and tenderness of sexual union and joyful commitment to the end of their lives. The delight and tenderness of sexual union. Isn't that lovely? Here's that intimate one flesh union that Paul speaks about, the very opposite of the fragmentation that had been my previous experience. <clears throat> And in fact, this reading we've just had from Ephesians chapter 5 was the reading that Chris and I chose for our wedding. My mum wasn't at all sure what she or many of her middle-aged friends who came to the wedding would make of all this talk of submission. But Chris and I were cool about it. We knew that we were both totally submitted to the Lord and that he would help us work out how to order our marriage in a loving and respectful way in a way that would help us individually and together grow more into Christ, and he has. So we came to marriage with high hopes, great expectations of what it might hold, and in so many ways, these have been completely met and often exceeded. I love the bit at the end of Pride and Prejudice, some of you might not know it, but it's one of my favorite things, where Mrs. Bennett turns to Mr. Bennett and says, oh, Mr. Bennett, God has been very good to us. And that's often how I feel. God has been very good to us. But does that mean that our marriage has been perfect? That we've had no areas of struggle? 
Absolutely not. And one of the areas that we've had to work at over the years is our sexual relationship. I know that just this last week, a number of couples getting married in the coming year have embarked on the marriage preparation course led by Tom and Sarah. It is a really good course, by the way. So if anyone's here thinking about getting married, do speak to Tom about that. I only remember one thing from our marriage preparation session back nearly 40 years ago. And that was something that Paul Berg, who was the vicar who married us and is well known to Sai, said about sex. He compared it to being like learning to play the violin. You have a beautiful instrument capable of making an exquisite sound, but it can take practice and persistence to help it reach its potential. People don't really talk about sex, about sex in real life very much, do they? Of course, we're bombarded with how sex is portrayed in books, in films, usually in an idealized, totally amazing way, which may well be the experience for some, but which I can tell you is definitely not the experience of all, at least not all the time. Real life can and does sometimes get in the way of us having a full and satisfying sex life. When your dog tired, working long hours up with the kids at night, when you've got worries about health, finances, family, work, or when you've had an argument or arguments that haven't been resolved, these sorts of things can get in the way. But sometimes there's other deeper stuff that gets in the way as well, and that was the case for me. It was a bit of a mystery why I found sex difficult when we got married, especially given my previous history. But actually, it was a mystery that got solved as the years went on. You see, in the months leading up to our marriage, I experienced a painful rejection with my closest friend, and this triggered a real emotional crisis in me. So in the early years of our marriage, I found myself becoming more and more emotionally crippled. We often joke that Chris married me thinking he was getting one thing and found out he got a whole lot more than he bargained for. He says that he forgot to read the small print. But that's part of the beauty and gift of the marriage relationship within the commitment of the promises we make to have and to hold one another for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Within the security and commitment of those promises, we can find a place to begin to open up the hidden corners of our lives and to allow the light and love of Jesus to bring healing where it's needed. And that's what happened for me. I didn't understand it at the time, but over the years, I came to understand why that rejection I experienced just before we got married, why that had the impact it did. You see, it touched on a deep and painful wound within me. It went back right to my start in life. When born seven weeks prematurely and nearly dying in the process, I was then completely separated from my mother for five weeks. The emotional damage done at this incredibly formative stage of life was compounded when I was sexually abused as a small child living in India. And then told by my ayah, that's my nanny, the person who should have been looking after me, that if I ever told anyone about it, then I'd die. She didn't know that the threat and fear of death was already there at the core of my being because of what had happened at my birth experience. But the impact of all that happened was that basically I pushed the whole thing down. I cut it off. I cut off this most precious, truly real, deep part of me because that was the only way I knew how to survive. No wonder I felt lost in my teenage years. I really was, in more ways than one. And small wonder that I found sex difficult when we got married, because that experience of rejection had touched on, had begun to open up these deep and painful wounds, including the wound of abuse. Feelings of terror, shame, and fear had begun to be awakened. I didn't recognize them as such initially, but I did as the years went on. As God brought more and more revelation to the fore, 
and mercifully as he brought more and more healing to the depths of my being. Of course, not everyone will have the same experience as me, but I can't imagine many of us come through life totally unscathed. It's not like we're Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, naked and knowing no shame. For most, if not all of us, life is much more complicated. But thank goodness that as Christians, we believe in a God in whose kingdom broken lives are made new. And marriage is one, although by no means the only place where we can find healing, find wholeness, and grow to become more fully the people God created us to be. But, and this is a big but, if we're going to have those sort of healthy, life-giving relationships that enable this sort of healing and growth to happen, then we have to invest in them. We have to protect our marriage relationships because there's no automatic guarantee. Have you ever noticed how imaginative and inventive people are when they're starting out on a relationship? They take great care of their appearance. They find fun and exciting things to do together. They talk for hours and hours. But it's very easy to get a bit sloppy when we've been married for a while, perhaps to begin to take each other for granted, to stop talking. And we do so at our peril. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, says this, Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. We're sexual beings, and none of us, whether single or married, is exempt from sexual temptation. Peter warns us in his first letter of the reality of temptation in life. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Unhelpful, unhealthy thoughts and temptations can come at us when we least expect them. So we need to be alert and attentive to resist the temptations that come at us, standing firm in our faith. And when we fall, as any of us may do, we need to be quick to come back to God, to confess our sins and to pray for each other so that we may be healed. So for those of us who are married, let's make sure we cherish this gift of sex that God's given. Let's make sure we make time to make love. And if there are times when sex is difficult for whatever reason, let's be sure we find other ways of connecting physically and emotionally. Because intimacy doesn't just happen when we have sex. I think some of the most important intimate moments that Chris and I have ever shared have come when we've dared to open up and trust each other with our tender, intimate stuff. Giving ourselves to each other emotionally and spiritually as well as physically, not holding back. Now, I can imagine some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, that's all well and good. You've got each other. What about me? I'm on my own. And you know, I wouldn't blame you at all if that's what you're thinking. It's completely understandable. To sit listening to a talk on sex and marriage when you're single could be difficult. Now, I know it's not going to be like that for everyone. There'll be some who are single who are perfectly fine about it. Maybe you're at a stage in life where marriage feels like it's a million miles away. Or maybe you're just not someone who feels the need for a significant other. But I'm guessing that there may well be some who are single who wish it were otherwise. Some who've been married and experienced the pain and heartache of loss whether through divorce or bereavement. Some who are still hoping, praying, watching, waiting for God to bring that someone special into your life. And then there may be some who are not at all sure that marriage will ever be an option 
because you find yourself attracted to members of the same sex. How do we respond to the words we find in Genesis chapter 2 when the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper suitable for him. How do we respond to those words when it turns out that a suitable helper may not be someone of the opposite sex, as it is for the vast majority of us, but someone of the same sex? As I said earlier, the reason why we're doing this and our morning sermon series is to lay some foundations for the discussions on human sexuality that are going on in the Church of England at this time. As Vicky said last week, it is amazing to think that it was only back in 1967, 55 years ago, that homosexuality was decriminalized in the UK. And it was about 25 years ago that I remember first being challenged to think a little bit more broadly and openly about these issues than I'd previously done. Up until that point, it had seemed to me to be very clear what the Bible had to say about homosexuality. I mean, it was obvious. It had to be wrong, didn't it? But in the years that have followed, I've done a lot of listening, praying, reading, reflecting, and I've discovered that maybe things aren't quite as clear-cut as I once thought. Take a look at this picture for a moment. Put your hand up if you see an old woman in it. Put your hand up if you see a young woman. Okay, those of you watching online, do feel free to write in the chat what you see. It's about half and half. Put your hand up if you can see both. Some of you will have seen it before, won't you? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, what do you mean both? <laughs> I mean, it's obvious. It's an old woman or a young woman, whichever you happen to have seen. But if you look at it for long enough, you'll find that you can see both. The clue for the old woman is her nose and her chin. And the clue for the young woman is her hair and her choker. Ask afterwards if you still can't see them both and you want to know. It can be very frustrating. But the point is this. It's the same picture that we're looking at. We just see different things in it. And it's a bit like that when it comes to interpreting what the Bible says and doesn't say about same-sex relationships. Tom did a great job a couple of weeks ago at outlining the position of those who hold an orthodox understanding on issues of human sexuality, that marriage is between one woman and one man, and that singleness or celibacy are the only two alternatives that are blessed by God. Those like me who have come to a revisionist understanding of these issues believe that it's possible and plausible to find a different way of joining the biblical dots. Recognizing that the texts of scripture and the interpretive process are not one and the same thing. It's not just about asking what the text meant at the time that it was written. And actually, we don't always know the answer to that anyway. It's also about asking what it means for a believing church today. It's about recognizing that in the Church of England, there are four pillars on which we develop our theological understanding. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And in the 55 years since homosexuality was decriminalized, there's been a huge amount of research that's led to a much greater understanding of the nature of same-sex attraction. I remember early on in my thinking about these things, this quote from a theologian called Lewis Smedes really struck a chord with me. This is what he said. In my experience, no one ever makes the choice to be gay. They only make the painful discovery that they are. And more recently, I came across this quote from a psychologist called David Myers, an evangelical Christian from the Dutch Reformed Church. Sexual orientation in some ways is like left-handedness. Most people are one way, some the other. A very few are truly ambidextrous. Regardless, the way one is 
endures. As we, along with Christians all over the world, grapple with these important issues, alongside the questions of biblical interpretation, we need to take seriously the psychological research and clinical conclusions that have emerged in recent years, integrating them into our Christian reflection and practice. And we need to listen to the stories and experience of our Christian brothers and sisters who belong to the LGBTQ plus community because their stories matter, they matter. It breaks my heart when I hear stories of Christians from these communities who've not found church to be a welcoming, inclusive place or worse still, have found it to be a place where real damage has been done. Jesus never said a word about same-sex attraction or relationships. But he did so much to reach out to those on the margins of society, to welcome them into the kingdom. And I long that we, his church, might do the same. I get that we're not all going to see the picture the same way, that godly Christians can and do hold different views on these issues. But we can still live well together as we determine to love and respect one another. As we continue to seek God's mind and know his heart in the months and years to come. I'm very aware that I've barely even begun to outline the revisionist line of thinking around issues of human sexuality. There just hasn't been the time or space in this context. But if anyone's interested in exploring it further, a book that I've found really helpful and accessible to read is this. It's called Changing Our Mind by David Gushy, who's an American ethics professor. I commend it to you. At the end of the day, whether we're straight or gay, single or married, I believe God calls us to order our lives, including our sexuality, in as responsible and godly a way as possible. And we in the church must do all we can to help and support each other in this, because it isn't always easy. I'm reminded of this verse from an old hymn that may be familiar to some of you. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of your peace. The beauty of your peace. Don't we all want, all need more of that? So as we draw to a close, I want to take us back to our Bible reading in Ephesians chapter 5. This beautiful picture of marriage being likened to the relationship Christ has with his church, his body. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. How wonderful it is that whatever our sexuality, whatever our position in life, we're loved by Jesus, called into a relationship of love and trust with him. We're forgiven, we're cleansed. He makes us holy and blameless in his sight. Jesus is 100% committed to us to have and to hold for better, for worse. Our identity is first and foremost in Christ. We are his bride and one day we're gonna be there center stage with him at the wedding of the Lamb. It is indeed a profound mystery, as Paul says. Mm -hmm.